And so tonight we're looking at uh, Mary's song, and I'm going to read for us as we get underway tonight out of Luke chapter 1, and uh, uh, looking at uh, Mary going to visit her, her uh, relative Elizabeth. So I'm going to start at verse 39 and go to uh, verse 56, 39 to 56 of Luke chapter 1. Now at this time Mary arose and went in a hurry to the hill country to a city of Judah and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she cried out with a loud voice and said, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord would come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, My soul exalts the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. For he has had regard for the humble state of his bond slave. For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name, and his mercies upon generation after generation toward those who fear him. He has done mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in the thoughts of their heart. He has brought down rulers from their thrones and has exalted those who were humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent away the rich empty-handed. He has given help to his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his descendants forever. And let's pause once again and ask the Lord's blessing. Father, bless our time together as we enter this Christmas season and the world around us is, is filled with violence and all kinds of chaos. We pray that you would give to us a settled peace and a rest and a calmness in our souls as we contemplate of the great gift of your Son to us. May this Christmas season be especially blessed uh, for each one of us and our families and our church family together. Now uh, we pray your blessing and help in our study together tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. I would like to introduce to you one of the greatest theologians of all time. This is an individual who has studied Scripture carefully and thoroughly and is able, apparently on a moment's notice, to quote and allude to dozens of passages of Scripture going back hundreds and hundreds of years and pulled together information about the plan of God and the program of God and the character of God and weave it seamlessly into a beautiful tapestry. And her name is Mary. And we're looking at the theology of Mary tonight in her song. There are four things I want to call to your attention. First of all, in verses 46 and 47, Mary exalted the Lord. Mary exalted the Lord. Secondly, in verses 48 through 50, Mary recognized God's great actions. Thirdly, in verses 51 through 53, Mary knew that God exalts and humbles. And then fourthly and finally, Mary saw that God remembers his word in verses 54 and 55. Observe with me, first of all, that Mary exalted the Lord in verses 46 and 47, where she said, my soul exalts the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, for he has had regard for the humble estate of his bond slave. For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed. Mary exalts the Lord, and uh, to exalt is to lift up to praise, to glorify, and she is lifting up the name of God, and she is uh, magnifying his position and his character. It's a, a, a song of praise here, uh, to make large, to raise up, and this is a, a parallelism. Uh, remember that in the Old Testament, a, a key signature of Hebrew poetry was to have one line saying something, and then the next line kind of goes in the same direction. Sometimes it might go in the opposite direction, but it's, it's stating a truth uh, by paralleling two different things. 
And so Mary is using that same kind of technique here uh, when she says, my soul exalts the Lord, my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. Uh, those, are, those are going the same direction. And observe that uh, her exaltation of God is tied to her rejoicing. Uh, let me put it a different way. When we focus on what I think I need and what I think I deserve and how people around me are treating me and how life is going, in my opinion, for me, uh, very quickly I can get upset, angry, selfish, bitter. But if I exalt the Lord, there is a natural tendency in the heart of the redeemed person to rejoice. In other words, the exaltation of God is tied to our rejoicing. And that's what she says, my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. The word that she chooses to use here for joy is not the standard run-of-the-mill word for joy that's found numerous times in the New Testament. This is a more specialized term. It has the idea of leaping for joy. It's, think of a, a lamb in the springtime. I think they call it pronging. Antelopes and sheep do that. They kind of bound on all four legs just for the sheer joy of being alive. This is a, a visible exuberance. This is overflowing. And Mary is saying, my spirit is overflowing with joy. Why? Look at the last phrase of, of uh, 47. My spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. Now, you are no doubt aware that the Roman Catholic uh, church has taken Mary and put her in a position that I am extremely confident if she knew how Catholics feel about her, she would be absolutely devastated. She would be horrified to think that Roman Catholic people worship her and pray to her. She wouldn't want that at all. In fact, right here, when she says, my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, she is acknowledging that she is a sinner who needs a Savior. She's not the perpetual virgin. She's not holy any more than anybody else is holy. She's a woman in need of a relationship with God, and she acknowledges it. She said as much. But in her position as one who has trusted in God's program, she is saying, I rejoice in God my Savior. Friends, do you realize that for us who are Christians, there is no worst case scenario? I remember reading, I think I've shared this with you before, many, many years ago I read about uh, Pentagon policies and how the Defense Department periodically, periodically will run war games, computer and in the field, and they'll, they'll pivot blue team against red team uh, and, and figure out Okay, what, what happens? What goes right? What goes wrong? And sometimes in war games, the Defense Department will, will do a, an extreme case, the worst case scenario. Everything that could go wrong does go wrong. Communications goes down. Command and control, the headquarters, gets bombed and it's eradicated. Uh, front lines lose touch with other units around them. There's a penetration of the enemy into lines of communication. And everything is going sideways. And now, you know, your units have to try to figure out what do we do? You know, who, who gives us orders? What are we supposed to do? Because we, we don't know which way the enemy is. How do we get more ammunition? How do we get reinforcements? That's a worst case scenario. And it's scary. What do you think? is the worst case scenario for a Christian. Well, out there in the world, out there in, in, in the world without Jesus Christ, worst case scenario is death. You die, uh, you die either easily or painfully, and that's it. And then what happens after? Well, they don't know. They're very scared of it. They, they don't understand. Is it bad? Is it good? Is there nothing? Are you annihilated? And for the world, death is the worst case scenario. What's the worst case scenario for a Christian? There isn't any. There isn't any worst case scenario. 
if I die, I'm with Jesus. My, uh, you know, any, any little glitches in my life, any pain, any sorrow that I've experienced, it's all done. Uh, any disappointments, any frustrations, I'm with Jesus. And I am in his presence, enjoying him forever. All pain, all sorrow, all regret, gone. And with my best friend, the Lord Jesus, forever and ever. There is no worst case scenario for Christians. And Mary says uh, that she has rejoiced with exuberance in God my Savior. Friends, we can rejoice too. Uh, if we know God is our Savior, if we have placed our faith in God's program of redemption, then we, along with Mary, can say, I rejoice. Uh, God has given to me salvation, security, a future, and it's all mine because of, uh, because of his grace. By the way, we should teach our kids to magnify God. Uh, we should show them what it looks like to, to live a life that exalts and magnifies God. We should show them what it looks like to rejoice. We ought not be bitter people. We ought not to be angry people or resentful. Uh, we ought to be those who magnify the Lord and exalt uh, God. And Mary has this personal relationship, observe, God, my Savior. Now, notice secondly, starting in verse 48 uh, through 50, Mary recognized God's great actions. So this section is about God's great activity and its character, and it begins in, in verse 48, for he has had regard for the humble state of his bond slave, for behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is upon generation after generation toward those who fear him. By the way, Mary is quoting extensively from 1 Samuel, uh, the book of Judges, uh, quite a few quotes from Psalms, uh, Isaiah, Micah. So she's very familiar with the Old Testament, and she's using that. She's weaving those references and allusions and quotations uh, into her song. And here she's saying uh, that her state uh, is humble. He has had regard for the humble state of his bond slave. She's lowly. She's low on the totem pole, and she is thanking God that he looks down and he sees us for who we are and what we are, but he doesn't, uh, he's not like the world out there where you have to be self-promoting to have any status. You, you have to aggrandize yourself. You have to make yourself big in order for people to take note of you. Uh, and Mary says he's had regard for the humble state of his bond slave. Uh, God is a God who understands what it is to be uh, humble in his presence. And God's action, he regards us, he looks at us. Uh, he sees us even in our mother's womb, Psalm 139 says. Uh, he sees us in our sin. He, he knows when we sin. He knows what our sin is. Uh, he sees us at all times. He, he has regard for us, and he knows what's going on in our lives, and he knows about our spiritual poverty. So uh, one of the more interesting scenes in, in uh, the New Testament is the Lord Jesus leaving Capernaum and going by the toll booth and looking at the toll booth operator and saying to him, come follow me. And the toll booth operator said, okay. He dropped his equipment and he got up. His name, you know, was Matthew. He is the author of the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus looked at him. The word for look there is not just a passing glance. It's a, an intense eye contact. Jesus looked at Matthew and he knew who he was. He understood who this man is. Probably Matthew uh, lived in derision from other Jews because they thought that anybody who collaborated with the Roman government was a traitor. And, you know, who knows what Matthew thought of himself. But Jesus looked at Matthew and he said, follow me. Aren't you glad Jesus saw you and me? 
He looked at us and he knew exactly who we are and what we are. He knew all about our sin. He knew all about our, our status. He knew everything about our failures, our character, our background. He knew the, the things that bother us. He knows all that, and yet he loves us. And he looked at us, and he says, come, follow me. And so uh, the Lord has had regard for Mary in her humble state. And Mary recognized that it was God who had done great things for her. In verse 49, for the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. You know, we need to cultivate an awareness in our lives of the blessings that God gives to us. Uh, so, Joe Subaru is either going to wait for new tires or it's going to be a couple inches higher after he takes the inner fenders off. Uh, but that's a blessing. There's an acknowledgement that God cares, that he gives us what we need and more. Uh, you know, one of the saddest things that can happen to somebody, and you have seen it happen to Christians, and I have too, is the growth and development of bitterness. People get bitter. Uh, they become sour. They become angry. They have this sense of entitlement, and what life dished out to them is not what they felt they deserved, and now they're grouchy, they're ornery. We shouldn't be like that. Cultivate a sweet spirit by doing what Mary did. She's talking about God has done great things for me. God has blessed me. God has given me so many wonderful things. And Mary is concentrating on the goodness of God and the greatness of God. Uh, and uh, she, is, she is calling attention to his kindness and compassion. She knows where her help comes from, and her help comes from, from the Lord. Uh, the mighty one has done great things for me. And then uh, notice in verse 49, the second part, holy is his name. Now, that might seem like a parenthesis because she's been talking about God's compassion and his blessings and his gifts and so on. It's not really a parenthesis, though. It's more like an anchor point. The holiness of God is not an addendum to God's character. It's not something extra tacked on. It is built into the very fabric of who God is. The world doesn't understand this, that God is holy. He is separate from sin in every way. He is consecrated apart from all things that are profane and ordinary, and his character is holy. Verse 50, his mercy is upon generation after generation uh, towards those who fear him and those who obey him and love him and, and reverence him. God blesses them and watches over them and has mercy toward them. Now, notice thirdly, Mary knows that God exalts and humbles in verses 51, 52, and 53. Uh, God can and he has used the wealthy and the powerful. But as a trend, as a, as a theme that runs through the whole Bible, God seems to especially delight in using the lowly and the humble. Uh, do you remember the, the scene? We won't look there, but early in the book of Acts, uh, the apostles, uh, namely Peter and John, are called in before the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin are Jewish scholars they're elite, they have studied under great rabbis, they're very intelligent, very powerful, and they have uh, Peter and John come in, and they're, they're examining them, they're, they're, they're questioning them about who they are and what they think they're doing by talking about Jesus of Nazareth in Jerusalem and telling people that he has risen from the dead and that there's salvation through believing in, in Christ. And the Sanhedrin very upset about this. And so they're questioning them. And in the process of questioning uh, uh, Peter and John, it says that they came to the, the realization that they were uneducated men, meaning they hadn't been to approved Sanhedrin schools. They hadn't gone to seminary. 
They were not highly trained in the, in the sense that they, the Sanhedrin, are. Well, the, the apostles later on are said to have turned the world upside down. These fishermen from Galilee, these tax collectors from Capernaum, these ordinary, lowly people God used to start a new thing, a new organism, a new uh, earth-shattering idea, namely the church. That was 2,000 years ago. And guess what? The church is still here. The church is still doing God's work. People are still getting saved. They're still hearing the gospel and being brought to a saving knowledge of Christ. They're still getting baptized. They're still dedicating their lives to serving God. And uh, we here in America, we feel like you know Christianity might be on its last legs. Maybe yes, maybe no. But guess what? In other parts of the world, Christianity is exploding. China and uh, the Southern Hemisphere, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, there are house churches and people getting saved every single day. The church is the most powerful thing on earth for the last 2,000 years. Well, uh, he has had regard for the humble, the lowly. And Mary says that there in verse 51. He has done mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in the thoughts of their heart. He has brought down rulers from their thrones. He has exalted those who were humble. And you can remember along with me, say like Daniel, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, one of the greatest kings who ever lived. Uh, you know, we don't even know how to begin to measure his magnitude, his influence and power, his wealth. But uh, he's the guy who lost his mind and lived like a cow for seven years until God gave him his sanity back. And so God certainly has the capability of, of taking somebody from nowhere and raising him up and taking somebody who thinks he's awesome and great and powerful and bringing him down. And the Bible is full of records of that kind of thing. So Mary knew that God exalts and he humbles. God sets rulers up and he takes them down. Folks, don't be a people pleaser. The person you're trying to please today may not even be around tomorrow. The, the, the person you think you've got to impress because he or she is powerful, influential, rich, runs a business or whatever it is, that individual um, may not be that important tomorrow. The one person you have to impress is God. The one person you've, you really need to please <clears throat> is not a human being, but God himself. And Mary knew that God exalts and he humbles. And then fourthly and lastly, in verses 54 and 55, Mary the theologian says that she remembers, rather that God remembers his word. So in verse 54, he, God, has given help to Israel, his servant, <clears throat> in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his descendants forever. So <clears throat> Mary, in her song, is acknowledging that God remembers his promises. God remembers when he makes a promise to somebody, and he keeps his promise. The, the specific promise that she's referencing is Abraham, God said to him, <clears throat> through you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And now she, Mary, is going to be the instrument for that. Uh, God is going to use her to be the mother of the Messiah. And the Messiah is the greatest blessing for the entire world ever imaginable because it is through him that we get salvation. It is through the person and work of Christ that we can have a relationship with God the Father and so much more. 
uh, one day he's coming back and he's going to set up a kingdom. I tell you what, the kingdom of Jesus Christ is going to make all the nations of the world look like um, three-year-old attempts at organization and efficiency. The kingdom of God on earth is going to be something to behold. And that's the blessing of God through Christ to all the world. And so uh, notice that, that uh, she says in verse 55, as he spoke. In the Greek language, it's just as, uh, exactly as he spoke. How long ago was that for Mary? 2,100 years. Do you think that there's a statute of, lim uh, of limitations on God's promises? When God says, I'm going to do this, and then the, the days tick by, and then the years tick by, and then the decades, and the cent does God ever say, well, you know, the warranty ran out on that? No. When he makes a promise, he keeps his promise. It's all his time. His time, yes. And, and the, the Jews for hundreds of years were saying, is it time, is it time? And it wasn't time. But in God's time, he brings about exactly what he said he would do. He keeps his word. And Mary exalts God because she connects the dots of God's promise 2,100 years earlier to Abraham, all the way down to where she's at and what God is doing in her life. And so Mary is a great theologian. She is a, a, a wonderful, godly woman. Uh, highly likely that she's still a teenager, by the way. You know, she might be in her early 20s, but she could well be 18, 19 years old. And, and God has chosen her to be the mother of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And so she uh, has these points of theology that she wants to make. Uh, and she has said uh, the following, she exalted the Lord. She lifted up the name of God, the character of God, she recognized God's great actions, that God is a great God and he does great things. Uh, she knew that God exalts and humbles. He is in charge of the world scene and he can lift people up and he can take them down. And now finally, she sees that God remembers his word. Uh, so there are several things we, we could do with that last point, God remembers his word. God who cannot lie promised long ages ago. Or even in our memory verse uh, section this, this year, Hebrews 10, uh, he who promised is faithful. And, and we see that over and over again. That when God makes a promise, he always keeps it. God is a promise-keeping God. And so we can depend upon him. So Mary... Uh, I think that when we get to, to glory, no doubt when we look up Mary, you know, we'll, we'll ask, uh, so what was it like? You know, did you face a lot of ridicule from neighbors and family and so on, uh, being pregnant before you were together with Joseph? And, what, you know, what was that? But I'm guessing that uh, very quickly she will want to turn the, the conversation to, let me tell you about what I learned about God. Let me tell you about what I learned about how good God is. Uh, can, I, can I explain to you how much God blessed me in my life? And so Mary is a great theologian. It's been good to be together. Let's remember to pray for one another this week. Uh, people traveling, people with medical appointments, um, a lot of uh, different activities. I'm sure there's office parties and stuff going on like that. So be in prayer for all the various pieces of our lives that are floating around this December. And uh, be safe in your travels. Please stand with me and we'll pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for Mary and for her wonderful theology, for the fact that she knew you and she praised you. She was willing to obey you in every part of her life. 
And we would ask you to implant in our own souls the same desires that Mary had, to love you, to be fully devoted, uh, to exalt you, to magnify you in, in all areas. So Father, bless us this week. Uh, give to us the joy of the Lord and opportunities to serve you, to point others to Christ. Uh, keep safe those who have to travel and uh, grant that you would help us uh, as we uh, go through this busy, busy month not to become so distracted by things that are happening that we forget to, to love you and to praise you. So we ask your blessing upon us tonight and we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. We are dismissed.